Hello everyone, let's analyze. So in the last lecture we defined what an ordered field is, but an ordered field is not sufficient to generate the reals. Uh, in fact, the set of all rational numbers uh, compose an ordered field. But what about irrational numbers? What about the square root of 2? We would like for that to be a number. So in fact, to build the real numbers, we need one more axiom. Uh, we need the least upper bound property, also called the completeness property or axiom. The set of real numbers is the ordered field or is an ordered field that has the least upper bound property. In fact, any ordered field that has the least upper bound property is isomorphic to the set of real numbers. In other words, you can prove that there is a one-to-one -one and onto relationship between any ordered field that satisfies the least upper bound property and the set of real numbers. So if this is the last axiom that cinches what generates or what axiomatically creates the set of real numbers, what is it? Well, it's the property that every subset of the real numbers that has an upper bound also has a real least upper bound. Well, what's an upper bound and what's a least upper bound? An upper bound is exactly what it says. It's an upper bound. If M is an upper bound of a subset, then M is greater than every element in the subset. You might imagine from that what the definition of a lower bound is. M is a lower bound of a subset if it's less than every element in the subset, or less than or equal to. Both upper bounds and lower bounds uh, can be greater than or less than or equal to, respectively. So, for example, consider the set of numbers that are greater than or equal to zero and also less than or equal to zero. All right? I think it's pretty clear from our intuition that uh, a lower bound is zero. Because zero is less than or equal to every entry in that set by definition. But so is negative 1. Negative 1 is a lower bound because negative 1 is less than 0, which is less than or equal to every entry of that set. Let's consider the set of every number greater than or equal to 0. We typically write this closed interval 0 to open interval infinity. The infinity side is open because, well, it's never achieved. Infinity is just the absence of an upper bound. We know that every number greater than or equal to 0 is unbounded from above because we can always add 1 to it. Now, we say a set is bounded if it has both an upper bound and a lower bound. So the first example is an example of a bounded set. The second example is an example of an unbounded set. Even though it's bounded from below, it is not bounded from above. So the set of integers is unbounded. I can always add 1 or subtract 1. The set of natural numbers unbounded because I can always add 1. Now, of course, any finite set is bounded. So what is the least upper bound? Well, I don't think it's shocking if I tell you that the least upper bound is, of all the upper bounds, the least one. It's exactly what the name implies. A synonym of least upper bound is the supremum, often abbreviated SUP. So x is a supremum or least upper bound of a subset s if it's well an upper bound and it's less than all other upper bounds or less than or equal to all upper bounds a number is the greatest lower bound if of all the lower bounds, it's the greatest. 
you probably saw that definition coming. This means that y is a greatest lower bound, or infimum, often abbreviated inf, if y is a lower bound for s, and of all the lower bounds, y is greater than or equal to them. So for example, let's consider the finite set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 is greater than or equal to every element in the set. And any other upper bound is bigger than 10. So 10 is the sub. The infimum is 1. Let's consider the open interval 0 to 1. Well, the supremum of the set is 1, and the infimum of the set is 0. Okay. Now let's notice that this set doesn't actually have a maximum and a minimum. 1 is not the biggest element of that set because 1's not in that set. There is no biggest element. Any element of the set has a bigger number. And 1's bigger than all of them, but of course not contained in the set. Now this is something that we're actually going to prove quite carefully for uh, a similar uh, open interval. Before we do that, let's define maximum and minimum. Of course, a maximum uh, is the greatest element of a set. Right? So the max of a subset is its largest element. Of course, notice the key is that m is the maximum if it's an upper bound of the set and contained in the set. The minimum is the least element of s. In other words, it's a lower bound and it's contained in the set. And of course, that's crucial. So for example, we know that the infimum of the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is 1. The minimum is also 1. 10 is the supremum. 10 is also the maximum, because 1 and 10 are both contained in the set. However, the open interval 0 to 1, in other words, the set of all numbers, greater than 0 and also less than 1, does not have a maximum or a minimum though it does have an infimum and a supremum. Okay. So this theorem gives us an alternate definition of the supremum. We can call it a definition because it's an if and only if statement. In other words, if conditions 1 and 2 are met for the number b, uh, then b is a least upper bound or a supremum of the set s. In other words, we could have taken this as the definition of supremum, and the previous definition we could have written as a theorem. What you take as the definition and what you take as a theorem is, well, a matter of aesthetics. I like the definition we gave because least upper bound is, well, the least upper bound. Okay, so let's read the theorem and understand what it's saying. It says b is a supremum of s if and only if b is an upper bound. Well, of course, that follows from the very definition. And for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists an element of s called x such that x is greater than b minus epsilon. So what exactly is this saying? In some sense, it's saying that there's no daylight between the supremum an element in the set. In other words, if I'm at the supremum, okay, the least upper bound, then I, if I move to the left by any amount, then the interval I created between the supremum x, I'm sorry, the supremum b and b minus epsilon contains an element in the middle, x. So, since the theorem is an if and only if statement, we do need to prove the implication both ways. So let's prove the forward implication first. So we need to show that if B is the supremum according to the definition, then B satisfies conditions 1 and 2. All right. So condition 1 follows uh, by definition. Right. The definition of a, of a supremum or a least upper bound is, well, it's an upper bound. Now, condition 2 
we would prove by contradiction. In other words, we're going to reduce this to absurdity by supposing the opposite. Okay? So we're going to suppose that b is the supremum and that 2 is false. If 2 is false, that means there does exist an epsilon greater than 0 for which there is no element of, X, of s that is greater than b minus epsilon. Let's think about what that means. It means if b is the supremum, then there is some non-zero distance to the left I can go, and in that interval between b and b minus epsilon, there is no element of s. Well, hopefully you can see where we're going. If I start at b and go to the left by epsilon, and nothing in that interval is contained in s, then that means I have found me a new least upper bound. But we suppose b is the upper bound. So let's do this carefully. If there's no x that satisfies x is greater than b minus epsilon, well, trichotomy says that x must be less than or equal to b minus epsilon right? for every x and s. Therefore, b minus epsilon is an upper bound. But b minus epsilon is to the left of b. In other words, it's less than b. So we have a new least upper bound. Well, that contradicts our supposition that b is the least upper bound. So we've proved a contradiction, and therefore, um, condition 2 is implied by the definition of the supremum. Now let's prove the reverse direction. In other words, we need to show that if B satisfies conditions 1 and 2, then it satisfies the definition of a supremum. Okay. So let's assume conditions 1 and 2 are true. B is an upper bound, and for any epsilon greater than 0, there exists an element of S that is to the right of b minus epsilon. In other words, there's something in this daylight. Right? If I start at b and go to the left by epsilon, something is contained in that interval. Okay, so how could we prove it? Well, for the sake of, for the sake of contradiction, uh, suppose that conditions 1 and 2 are true, but b is not the supremum. In other words, there is a lesser upper bound out there. Let's call it d. Okay. Since I'm supposing that D is a lesser upper bound and B is an upper bound, well then a B minus D must be positive because I'm supposing that D is less than B. Uh, so let's call that quantity epsilon. Right? And epsilon is positive. Condition 2 implies there exists an element of S that's greater than b minus epsilon. Well, if there's an element of, e, of s called x greater than b minus epsilon, then that element is greater than d because b minus epsilon is equal to b minus b minus d, which is b minus d minus minus d, which is d. In other words, there's an element of s bigger than what I supposed is an upper bound. But if d is an upper bound, that can't happen. So we've contradicted ourselves. Therefore, we've proven by contradiction that b is not only an upper bound, but it's the least upper bound or supremum of s. That's all for today.